Let's turn now to Amos chapter 7 and continue our journey through the word. Now, the Lord at the beginning of chapter 7 shows to Amos some of the things that has come into the mind of the Lord to do to awaken the people, to turn the people back to God. You know, God is very gracious as he works with us. When we start going astray, God will send along gentle reminders, sort of little notices, you're drifting, and little things that sort of stop you, maybe little setbacks, um, problems will arise, it could even be a traffic ticket. And, and the Lord is just sort of saying, be careful, you're straying. But if you don't listen, then he becomes a little more severe. It's a little heavier. And if you don't respond, a little heavier. Now, the work of God in our life is never to destroy. The work of God in our life is for our good. It's to awaken us to the dangerous waters through which we are seeking to ply. The dangerous territory that we are passing through. You're in danger. You're destroying yourself. And so God sends along these reminders. Now the Lord is showing to Amos some of the things that are potential uh, judgments in a sense, but on the other hand, awakeners. And I prefer uh, the awakeners to judgment because God is slow to judgment. He is plenteous in mercy and uh, usually these things are just to awaken us, to turn us from the path of destruction. So he said, thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, probably in a vision, uh, or it just could have been in his mind. He, he saw, and behold, he formed grasshoppers in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter growth. As, as the plants were just really coming up to uh, fruition, he saw these grasshoppers. And lo, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. And it came to pass that when they had made an end of eating the grass of the land, then I said, O oh Lord God, forgive, I beseech thee, by whom shall Jacob arise, for he is small. Uh, he saw this judgment or this plague of grasshoppers, locusts, that were devouring the land. And, and he cries out to the Lord. Uh, who's going to help Jacob? Jacob is small. And so the Lord repented for this, and it shall not be, saith the Lord. Now, there are passages in the Old Testament where it said, and God repented uh, that he had made man. And here again we have the case where it speaks about God repenting. The problem as we try to describe God or even think about God, we can only think and describe God in human language. And there is a barrier because we have to use human language to try to describe or define the characteristics of an infinite God, and it is very obvious that human language is infinitely shy of describing God. So we use the term repent. However, the scripture said that God is not 
a man that he should change, nor the son of man that he should repent. Hath he not spoken, and shall he not make it good? But when there appears to be a change, then uh, the word repent means to change. And when a certain judgment or uh, punishment has been uh, determined and then God relents, then we, we're sort of bound with the word, well, it repented God or God changed. But God doesn't change. He has made his purposes all the while. The purposes of God do stand. One of the characteristics of God, we call it the attribute of God, is his, and theologically, it has been given the term immutability of God. That is, he doesn't change. Behold, he said, I am the Lord God, I change not. So we are sort of stuck, though, with human language. But you can't think of it in the terms of, of when I repent. I say, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I won't do it again. You know, I promise, I promise. Uh, you, can't, you can't think of God repenting in that, in that light, in in that way, because uh, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. So uh, he, he says that it repented. In other words, the Lord said, okay, we won't send the locusts. So the Lord showed unto me, and behold, the Lord called to contend by fire. He devoured the great deep and did eat up a part. Then said I, O Lord God, cease, I beseech thee. By whom shall Jacob arise? For he is small. Uh, the, the judgment of fire that is suggested. And the Lord repented for this, and this also shall not be, saith the Lord. And thus he showed me, and, and, and these are visions, these are things that are coming into the mind of the prophet of possible ways by which God might judge, and, and he prays and, and intercedes for the people, and, and God said, all right, it will not be this way. So again he showed him, and the Lord stood upon a wall and made a plumb line, dropped the plumb line. And uh, the Lord said unto me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pass by them any more. And the high places of Isaac shall be desolate. The sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise again the house of Jeroboam with a sword. So God declares that he has dropped the plumb line and, and he's made the division and uh, they're, they're, they're not straight. They're, they're, they're a crooked bending wall and he will bring his judgment upon their places of worship and upon the house of Jeroboam. Now at this point, he has spoken against Jeroboam the king and so Amaziah, who was a priest of Bethel. Now, Bethel was one of the two cities of the northern kingdom of Israel where they had set up false worship, the worship of the calf, as the God who had brought them out of Israel. And so a priest of Bethel does not indicate a priest of God. Uh, but he is just one of the religious leaders. And uh, he sent to Jeroboam, the king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all of his words. Uh, this fellow is talking against you. 
It's a conspiracy against you. Right here in the middle of Israel, this fellow is speaking against you, and, and the land, we just can't bear the words. It's interesting how that those who are in sin do not want to hear reproof or rebuke. They don't want to hear the word of God. They close their ears, they close their hearts to the word of God. I thought it was quite interesting when uh, those fellows who call themselves queer nation uh, and act up, decided to act up here at the church. I thought it was interesting that they were yelling out, leave us alone. But where were they? <laughs> but I thought that that cry, leave us alone, that, that is really the attitude of the world in sin. They don't want to hear that they are doing wrong. Leave us alone. I thought that was very interesting because in the New Testament we find the demons saying that to Jesus. Leave us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou son of David? Have you come to torment us? But you know, it's interesting how the word of God does torment a man who's in sin. And, and how the cry is, leave us alone. And here is this priest saying, hey, we can't handle this fellow. We can't bear his words. For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam shall surely die by the sword. And Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. He's prophesying and predicting your death and the captivity of Israel. Now, it should be noted that Jeroboam was killed by the sword and Israel did go into captivity. Thus, what Amos was saying was true, but they didn't want to hear it. The truth. A lot of people don't want to hear it. <laughs> Sometimes the truth hurts. <laughs> we don't always like to face the truth. <laughs> but it's important. Also, Amaziah said unto Amos, O you seer, and seer is a seer is a referring to he sees in the spiritual realm, sees visions, uh, sees the realm of the spirit. Oh, you seer, go and flee away into the land of Judah. Go home, and there eat your bread and prophesy there. But don't prophesy again any more at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel. And it is the king's court. Get out of here. Go home. We don't want to hear you around here anymore. And so Amos answered Amaziah the priest. And he said, I was no prophet. And neither was I a prophet's son. But I was just a shepherd and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. It is thought that uh, the sycamore fruit was sort of a fig. And thus, Amos gets the title of the fig picker. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock. I was just out there following out to just a herdsman. Now, in, in the area where he came from, Tekoa, it is south of Bethlehem, and it is very barren. It is uh, south and east from Bethlehem and thus toward the Judean wilderness. In fact, you're already getting into pretty much desert area there at Tekoa. Uh, there, they have uh, probably no more than five or six inches of rain in an average year. Uh, it is a rather dry place, but... Uh, 
the, the sheep graze and all of those mountains going down towards the Dead Sea area and it is a place for the grazing of sheep to the present day. And so I was just there. I was just following the sheep. And uh, you that have been to Israel, you can uh, picture in your mind those many different uh, shepherds that you saw following the flocks over that uh, wilderness area. And he was just one of those fellows. I mean, they, they, don't, they, don't, you know, they, they don't look like they're very prominent. In fact, they, they look like uh, just, you know, uh, sort of nothing. <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't think of one of them as a bank president or something like that. Just common people. You know, and that's the thrill to me. God uses just common people. You know, so many times we're prone to excuse ourselves from the call of God because, you know, I'm, I'm not important. Uh, I have done nothing great. Uh, I'm just a common person. I'm just an ordinary person. Somehow we've got in our mind that God uses just super ordinary kind of people extremely talented and, and all, and, and, and those are the kind of people God, no, he usually uses just the common people. And he takes them out of their common place in life and calls them. And to Amos, the call was to prophesy. So I was just following after the sheep, and the Lord said to me, go and prophesy to my people Israel. It probably is uh, an indictment against the nation of Israel because surely uh, there were a lot of people in Israel, but the fact that there was none that God could call to prophesy to the people, choosing rather to go to this insignificant area of Tekoa, grab a shepherd and say, hey, I want you to go prophesy to Israel. Now, therefore, he said, hear the word of the Lord. Amaziah, you told me to get out of here and keep my mouth shut. <laughs> you say, prophesy not against Israel and drop not, th drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, you're in trouble. Your wife shall be a harlot in the city, and your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword, and the land shall be divided by line, the plumb line, and thou shalt die in a polluted land, and Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of his land. So heavy prophecy upon Amaziah and the future that awaits him is, is very bleak and dark indeed. Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, he said Amos, what do you see? And he said, I see a basket of summer fruit. Then he said the Lord unto me, the end is come, Upon my people of Israel, I will not again pass by them any more. And the songs of the temple shall be howling in that day, saith the Lord God. There shall be many dead bodies in every place. They shall cast them forth with silence. Desolation is coming. Destruction is coming. God is through dealing with them. I'm not going to pass by them. You know, it is a tragic day when God says, I, I'm through. And there have been those times in history. At the time of Noah, when the wickedness of the earth was exceedingly great, every man was doing his own thing. 
And God said to Noah, my spirit shall not always strive with man. And there came that time, God said, okay, I'm not going not gonna to strive anymore with you. I'm not going to deal anymore with you. I've given you every opportunity. I've warned you. And, and now you're going to see the other side. You're going to be destroyed. There, there's, no, there's, there's no value. There's, there's nothing left to deal with. It's over. And, and Jeremiah with Judah in the southern kingdom, much the same thing happened. Concerning Jeremiah and, and Ephraim, God said, Ephraim is given over to her idols. Let her alone. If you pray for her good, I will not hear you. How important it is that our hearts remain open, our hearts remain tender, and, and God can continue to speak because we will listen. But if you harden your heart, if you refuse to listen, it is possible that you can reach a point where God will say, okay, you crossed the line. Here he said they've crossed the line. I'm not going to pass by them again. The destruction awaits them. You know, it, it, I'm through. Hear this. The prophet said, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fall. One of the things that God abhors is the oppression of poor people, taking advantage of the poor. God has always been a champion for the poor. The scripture said, He that lendeth to the poor lendeth to the Lord. God champions the causes of the poor, and he hates people oppressing the poor or taking advantage of the poor. And that is one of the things they were doing. They swallowed up the poor, saying, When will the new moon be gone, that we may sell corn, and the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat? And you cheat. In your balances, you make the ephah small and the shekel great. Now, in those days, the merchants did not have, you know, computerized scales like we have today. Uh, but they, they had balances. And they had, of course, their little weights. And they put the weight on the balance and then they put the merchandise on the other side. And always, you know, you want a, a, a pound of potatoes, you put the pound weight on and, and you balance it out. Well, clever, conniving guys, they had one set of balances they'd used to buy with and another set to sell with. And so the lighter uh, weights were for their selling and the heavier weights buying, you know, well, I want a pound of of your merchandise and they put the heavy weight on and and it, it you know it's amazing how men can connive and figure out ways to take advantage of someone else and and that's what they were doing they were crooked they were dishonest but when this kind of 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 mentality exists within a nation when you're only scheming and conniving, trying to take advantage of someone else, willing to cheat, willing to lie for your own benefit, for your own gain, that kind of a moral breakdown soon leads to a national disorder and chaos. For a long time, the United States had a bureau, which was the Bureau of Standard Weights and Measures. And they had agents that would go around and they would have a precise gallon can and they would go to a service station and pour in a gallon of gas on the little meter and they would check it to make sure that it was a full gallon. They used to come into the market and, and we had the scales in the market and they would put the different weights to make sure that the scales and then they'd put their little seal 
on it, that they had checked it and it is standardized. We realize the importance of having standardized weights and measures uh, because you can't really operate a commercial society without a standardization. Here, these guys were cheating. Uh, they would make the EFAF small and the shekel great and falsifying their balances then by deceit. But the whole commercial interest, I mean, that, they, they said, oh, Sabbath day, oh, when will it get over so we can sell again? I mean, they, they, they were loathing the day of the Lord, the day of worship, the time out for worship. Wanting to get back, make money, make money, make money. I can remember the days here in the United States when the stores were all closed on Sunday. But we are much like Israel. You know, the big thing is let's make money. Commercialism. Now, that they, their purpose was that we may buy the poor for silver. They were, they were putting people into hock and, and uh, buying them, making them slaves. Buying the needy for a pair of shoes. And then they were selling the refuse of the wheat, the junk wheat, the rotten stuff. The Lord hath sworn by the excellency of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. A uh, couple of things. Number one, the Lord knows your works. Remember when Jesus was writing to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, to each of the churches he said, I know thy work. But not only does he know your works, he said, I won't forget your works. The only way he'll forget is when they are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank God for the covering. <laughs> Shall not the land tremble for this, and every one mourn that dwelleth therein? It shall rise up holy as a flood. It shall be cast out and drowned as by the flood of Egypt. This land's just going to be overcome. The, the enemy is going to come in and, and just overwhelm the land like the Nile River annually overflowing in Egypt in those days. Now in the midst of this, an interesting prophecy, it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, I will cause the sun to go down at noon and will darken the earth in a clear day. And I will turn your feast into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. And I will bring up sackcloth upon all the loins and baldness on every head. And I will make it as the mourning of an only son and the end thereof as a bitter day. And you think of a day in history when it became dark at noon and there was a great lamentation or mourning as for an only son. The Gospels tell us that as Jesus was hanging there on the cross, that suddenly at noon, darkness came over all the land. Interesting little prophecy concerning that day that would come when the sun would go down at noon and the earth would be darkened on a clear day. On a feast day, because it was the feast of Passover, the songs would be turned into lamentation and there would be the signs of mourning for death upon all of the people as they mourned for the only son. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, 
not a famine of bread, nor of thirst for water, but of hearing of the words of the Lord. When God would not speak, uh, we know that there was a period of 400 years that separates the Old Testament from the New Testament. During this 400 years time, there were no new prophecies. God wasn't speaking. God had sort of spoken the final word to the people through Malachi. And thus, between the end of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, and the New Testament, you have a 400-year famine for the word of God. People go around and say, well, heard from the Lord lately? No. What's the word of the Lord? Haven't heard. 400 years. The silence of God. A famine. Not of food, but a famine for the word of God. The hearing of the words of the Lord. You know... It is tragic, but there are too few churches that are just teaching the Bible today. You can go to church and find out all about uh, the latest political furor. Or you can get some reviews on some marvelous new books that have been written. And, and you can go to church and learn all about pop psychology and how to better relate to your wife, and how to be sweeter to your kids. And, but just to be taught the word of God, a famine for the word of God. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from north even to the east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. In that day, Shall the fair virgins and the young men faint for thirst? And they that swear by the sin of Samaria shall, and say, Thy God, O Dan, liveth. And the manner of Beersheba liveth. Even they shall fall and never rise up again. Uh, the, the, the God in Dan was the calf. And people were swearing and saying, Oh, thy God liveth, O Dan. Uh, but it was just nothing but an idol. And uh, the idea of the, the ways of Beersheba liveth, but they shall fall and never rise up again. Amos closes his prophecy, chapter 9, prophesying the dispersion of the people. I saw the Lord standing upon the altar, and he said, Smite the lintel of the door, that the post may shake, and cut them in the head, all of them, and I will slay the last of them with a sword, and he that fleeth of them shall not flee away, and he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. And though they dig into hell, thence shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down, or from there I will bring them down. And though they hide themselves in the top of Carmel, I will search and take them out from there. And though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea, from there I will command the serpent, and he shall bite them. God is going to pursue in judgment and there is no escaping of God and the hand of the judgment of God. David, in Psalm 139, as he was speaking of the omnipresence of God, where can I flee from thy presence, O Lord? If I ascend into heaven, lo, thou art there. If I descend into hell, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and I flee to the uttermost parts of the sea, even there 
you will surround me. Um, in a week, we're going to be getting to the book of Jonah, a very interesting story of a prophet of God who thought that he could escape from the presence of God. And, and chapter 1 tells us how that Jonah was trying to escape from the presence of God. You know, there are a lot of people like that today. They think that they can somehow escape the presence of God. God is going to begin to judge and there is no escaping. You know, there are a lot of people who are actually preparing to survive the Great Tribulation by storing food and all because they know it's going to be a time of tremendous famine. And so they're, they're storing their food in uh, containers that are, uh, will, will not, uh, you know, where they'll be safe from radioactivity fallout. And uh, they, they are setting aside their water and they're, they're digging these uh, shelters and, and all. In fact, you can even buy a kit uh, for one for 3,000 bucks and you have everything you need for seven years uh, to get you through the Great Tribulation. Uh, they also will sell you some automatic rifles so you can protect yourself. Uh, when people come to rip off your food, you'll be able to defend it. And uh, quite, a, quite a deal. Uh, and, and they think that somehow they can escape uh, from the judgments of God that are going to come upon the earth. But God said there's no escape. Though they dig into hell, I'll find them. <laughs> Though they climb up to heaven, I'll bring them down, you know, trying to hide in the caves going down into the bowels of the earth, you're not going to do it. And though they go into captivity before their enemies, there will I command the sword, and it shall slay them, and I will set mine eyes upon them for evil and not for good. They've gone over the line. There, there's no retracting. And the Lord God of hosts is he that toucheth the land, and it shall melt. And all that dwell therein shall mourn, and it shall rise up wholly like a flood, and shall be drowned as by the flood of Egypt. Same figure of speech used again. And he that buildeth his stories in the heaven, and hath founded his troop in the earth, and he that calleth for the waters of the sea, and poureth them out upon the face of the earth, Jehovah is his name, builds his stories, layers in the heavens, founded his troop in the earth, calls for the water of the sea, pours them out on the face of the earth. Are you not as children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel, saith the Lord? Have not I brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Camp Tor? and the Syrians from Kerr. Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from off the face of the earth, saying that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, saith the Lord. Going to destroy them, but not utterly, a remnant. For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations, like as corn is sifted in the sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. God watching over and careful. And all of the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say the evil shall not overtake nor prevail against us. People thinking they can escape the judgment of God thinking they can escape the wrath of God. But uh, that's folly. That's folly. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And God is going to bring a person into judgment for every sin 
that has not been confessed and covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, here, I mean, you can't get much worse than this. God is pursuing after them, destroying them, even in their enemies' lands when they've gone into captivity. They're still not going to get by. God is still going to bring the punishment. The sinners of my people shall die by the sword, those that thought that they had escaped. But in the midst of the darkness, I mean, you don't get much darker than this, God always never ends the story in darkness, but always brings it out into the light, the glorious hope of the future. You know, many times we go through some pretty dark valleys, dark experiences in life, but God never ends it there. He always brings you out into the light on the other side. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, shadows of death around me. But wait a minute. You can't have a shadow unless you've got light. And so death cast its shadow on my path, but I'm just walking past into the glorious light of God's eternal kingdom. And so the psalmist says, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Going into the light. Light on the other side. You cannot have a shadow except light on the other side. I think I mentioned a while back, but it's worth repeating, of that lady who got up in a testimony meeting and was telling of the horrible, horrible trial that she was going through. She thought that surely she couldn't make it. It was just pressing her down and she was about ready to just give up. And she said, I turned to the scriptures. I said, God, I'm about ready to fail. I need your help. And she said, I said, lead me, Lord. And I opened the Bible, and it fell open to Luke 2.1. And I read it, and I started praising the Lord. And I said, oh, God, thank you, thank you. And she said, I've got victory, even though the trial and the problem is still there. I've got real victory tonight because God spoke to me in Luke 2.1. Well, the pastor knew that Luke 2, 1 declared, and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. <laughs> and he wondered, what in the world <laughs> blessed her out of Caesar's ordering the whole world to be taxed? And so he said, just a minute, sister, stand up again. He said, I want to ask you something. He said, you, you tell us that God just blessed you in this midst of this horrible trial in Luke 2, 1. Just how did that speak to you? She said, well, I read it and it said, and it came to pass. She said, that's all I needed. It didn't come to stay. It came to pass. <laughs> The darkness may come, but it's come to pass. <laughs> and God always brings you out to the glorious light. In that day, all right, coming into it now, the light of the future, verse 11. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David, the house of David that is fallen. There has not been a, a king after David since Zedekiah. But God will raise up the tabernacle or house of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all of the heathen that are called by my name, saith the Lord, 
that will do this. The future is yet bright for God's people. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that there will be an abundance. The plowman will overtake the reaper. In other words, they'll still be reaping the abundant harvest when it's time to plow again. And the treader of the grapes, him that is sowing seed, the, the harvest of grapes so great that it'll last on through. And the mountains shall drop sweet wine and all of the hills shall melt. And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land which I have given them, saith Jehovah thy God. The day is coming. God is going to restore the people, the nation. Now, Israel is become a nation again and they have begun rebuilding the waste cities and in many places have rebuilt the waste cities. They have planted vineyards, many vineyards there on Mount Carmel, marvelous vineyards. They have planted their gardens. The, the nation is a very fruitful nation, abounding in fruit, vegetables. But what we see is not yet the fulfillment of Amos. Because the people that are there are yet to go through a very severe, severe testing and persecution and tribulation. I wish that I could tell you, oh, it's glorious, that, you know, this is the time and, and it's going to be the bright future for Israel. Long term, yes, but the, the nation right now is, is headed for some great problems, great turmoil. They're going to be invaded by a, a, a huge army uh, of, of Muslims. Uh, there's going to be a jihad, a holy war, uh, declared against Israel. Uh, God will defend them and deliver them, but it's, it's going to be tough. Uh, they are going to embrace uh, the Antichrist. Uh, and then he will turn against them and persecute them severely, even more severely than Hitler. It is after that that Amos brings us out into this glorious day of the Lord and the future when the people will inhabit the land and the Lord shall reign from Mount Zion and his kingdom will be over all the earth. But that's yet future. There's still some dark days before we come out into the glorious light of God's eternal plan and future for us. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for your word and for the opportunity, Lord, of studying learning and discovering your purposes and your plans for the future. Thank you, Father, for the principles that you have set. May we live by them and follow them. Thank you, Lord, for this evening. Give us ears to hear. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will indeed continue to teach us from your word that we might grow and become strong. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand? I pray that the Lord will just give you a fantastic,
fantastic week. Just surprise you with special blessings. Just in unexpected places and at unexpected times. May he just sort of reveal his closeness and the exceeding greatness of his love for you. May you be strengthened to stand against the powers of darkness that are so prevalent in the world in which we live today. And may the joy of the Lord be your strength. In Jesus' name. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.